Today's sermon title is Seeing, Knowing, Healing, Jesus and the Blind Beggar. Might we bow our heads, close our eyes for an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Parent, we come into your presence seeking, attempting to know the mystery that is inexhaustible, yet having the faith of blind people, we await your revelations to us. May we learn from a blind beggar and how you reach out into the madness that so often is our world so that we might reflect some of your light into its darker corners by perhaps living it out in small ways. May this come to pass through the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. I want to begin today by looking at Psalms 139. I might read it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. I'm reading from Mark 10, verses 46 to 52 now. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, and then the man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, the blind man regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. This story is about gravity and grace. A deep drama is being played. A deep drama is being played out between the human will and the gravity that it is bound to by living this, in this world and the gracious ways of God. The gravity of life 
having taken hold of Bartimaeus, has made life rather static, has blinded his eyes, has placed a person's dignity in the dust at the side of the road. But as the drama unfolds, we lay witness to a transforming encounter, a deep drama, and the Gospel of Mark goes to great lengths to communicate that drama. At the last stop before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus is confronted with a person. This is a curiously bold man. He is blind. He cannot see. He sits at the side of the road waiting for passers-by so that he may gain opportunity to score some money. He is a lowly beggar, a representative of society's lowest caste. He is just a blind beggar. Yes, just a dirty, blind beggar. But in his blindness, there is wisdom. He knows, even as he cannot see. He sees, even as he is blind. Bartimaeus is wise to something. Have you ever met a person like that? Someone who was a blind seer of sorts. They didn't literally have to be blind, but they were somehow out of the norm or on the periphery. Maybe in a way a social outcast. Perhaps they were debilitated somehow, or incapacitated, or awkward, or didn't quite fit in. And yet, yet, they had some unique insight into life. A certain knowledge of the world, a knowledge that maybe hard knocks teaches. Such knowledge can come from the most uncanny places sometimes. My uh, Yoda figure, person who got me really thinking heavily about the things, the deep things of God, was an outcast in the Adventist church. He had been living seven years with AIDS. He died of it after a decade of living with it. He was kind of a self-taught theologian. His name was Mike Rumbaugh. Smoked a lot, drank, and was a quite weakly, as you can imagine. He didn't, he didn't have HIV, he was living with AIDS. But I would go and sit with him and he would blow my mind repeatedly with things that he said. I was teaching political science at the time and he kept saying, you need to go into theology, Ray. I, would, I was offended at first. No, nah, man, politics. I don't need to hear that from you. Uh, but a year before he died, I gave him the news that I was going to be going to seminary. He was, he was well pleased. But his life was a life lived, for lack of a better term, rather rapaciously. Now, he knew God. Can I teach you something about the Gospel of Mark? Wisdom is a rare commodity in Mark. There is a word when I teach biblical ethics. The Bible has an F word, four letter word. It's the worst thing you can call someone. Fool the worst thing you can be called. 
In Mark, wisdom is rare. And names are important in Mark. Names and the lack thereof play a very important role in this gospel. Repeatedly in Mark, we are shown that the disciples, those well-named, those who are explicitly named, simply do not get it. The disciples are constantly fumbling and bumbling over the meaning of Jesus' words and deeds. They are always asking Jesus to explain, what does your parable mean? Jesus' chorus, his refrain, seems to be, do you fail to understand? In Mark, those men with familiar names who are closest to Jesus do not understand what it is he is trying to do or what he is trying to teach or how he is going about doing and teaching. In fact, this theme of intimacy and ignorance seems to crescendo in the scene immediately preceding Jesus' encounter with blind Bartimaeus. Teacher, James and John ask, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus' response, what is it you want me to do for you? Now, I don't know about you, but when I get a call from a friend, hey, Ray, I've got a big favor to ask. My, uh, my heart drops, but I don't answer with, well, what, what do you want me to do? If they were to ask me, I have something uh, that I want you to do for me, and I want you to do it no matter what it is, I, I, I may hang up the phone. Um, Jesus is at least intrigued. He must have been sorry to have been intrigued. The disciples, James and John, pressed to know where they might sit next to him in glory. They wanted to know about their hierarchical status. And they had it worked out. They told Jesus, we think we want to, you know, at least us two here, we should get the right and the left hand to you. We should be sitting at your right and left. Well, you, you choose which one. These seats represent the first and second positions after the king in, ancient, in the ancient world, in the biblical world. So I picture Jesus sighing when he responds to them, you do not know what you are asking. When the other disciples hear of this conversation, they get angered. Jesus calls the entire group to order. He tells them not to worry like the Gentiles. Don't worry about who lords over earthly things. Jesus' imperative is rather startling here. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life in ransom for many. Now, this is a most curious imperial arrangement. But with God, through Christ, it is not a question of hierarchy. It is not a question of your rank. It is a question of seeking. It is a question of knowing. It's not a question of social rank, but of seeking and of knowing. Verse 
when I see the news today, the bombs, the blood, the bodies, I wonder what it is I really know. You do know we are a country at world war. You didn't know. We're all worried about how much weight we need to lose. But you do know we're at world war. We don't know. We don't need to know. We can afford not to know. We're big and strong enough to not have to worry. This is why, to me, the world of the existentialist thinkers that is absurd makes some sense. It is madness. We fight drone wars by remote control. And we're all worried about how, you know, we're buying the 99 cent burgers. Or, or you snap it on the veggie burgers, which, whichever you may have, right? When I see and read in magazines and newspapers, on TV, countless articles I'm set over the internet, I see so very much. Is there such a thing as seeing too much? I see so much more than I can understand. I am bewildered in all my sight and all but neutralized in my knowing. Most of my life is spent seeing far more than I'm able to comprehend, seeing more, far more than I can understand. And then I juxtapose my proclivities in politics and world affairs, all this news reporting, with the so-called reality television that entertains us domestically. And it is a rather jarring juxtaposition for me. I see violence in the world, and I see vanity in our culture. So violence and vanity go on blissfully wed in my worldview. I see a lot. Bartimaeus cannot see. Bartimaeus sees nothing at all. It is all dark to Bart. And yet he knows something when he hears Jesus' presence nearby. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shh! You better shut your mouth. You better quiet down that dirty beggar. Son of David, who says that? Who talks like that? Them are fighting words around here. We don't need no trouble. We don't need anyone yelling out, Son of David. But he cried out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. What is Bartimaeus yelling for? What is he carrying on about? The crowd is not impressed. We are told quite explicitly in Mark what Bartimaeus means. He is son of Timaeus. And that is the literal translation in the Greek for Bar Timaeus. But the Markan gospel is unique among the gospels for making use of Aramaic and not just Greek words. This happens to be one of the times in Mark that Aramaic is employed. In Aramaic, Bartimaeus has a very different ring to it. And remember I said names are very important in Mark. In Aramaic, Bartimaeus means son of dirt. 
son of filth. Yes, he was a lowly beggar who sat in the dirt at the side of the road. In Jericho, he was probably well known as being a rather dirty, dust-covered, loudmouth. That was probably his natural state, I would imagine, covered with filth. How would we say his name today in Aramaic? Dirtbag? Scumbag? His mother didn't name him that. We named him that. You! You named him that. I name, I name him that. Who are you, you dirty beggar? Keep quiet, scumbag, filth, you're causing trouble. Bartimaeus cried even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops cold in his tracks. This is the only place in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is addressed as son of David. And there is no indication that Jesus rejects the title. Instead, Jesus commands that Bartimaeus be called forth and the epithet, son of David, by Bartimaeus, may already reveal a confession. A confession of faith by someone who is still in the dark. This is a confession of faith by someone who is blind but can see. Jesus' response to Bartimaeus is immediate and decisive. I imagine the crowd. Okay, Bart, old bean, you win. Today's your lucky day. Take heart. Your big mouth won Jesus' attention. He wants to see you. Bartimaeus' first move is very interesting. He throws off his robe, we are told. He throws off his cloak, which is exactly counter to Oriental custom. You want is supposed to clothe oneself before royalty. Bartimaeus throws off his cloak and springs up. Jesus asks of the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? A very curious question. I don't know what Jesus was thinking here. The guy's blind. What do you think he wants? But that's the small potatoes. Jesus just got through asking the same question to his own disciples, got slapped in the face for it. A very disappointing discussion Jesus had with his closest. I was taught in my second year in seminary we must never assume that the indigent, the poor, the beggars of this world, we must never assume they need anything from us. Our purpose is to work to view others as brothers and sisters, not merely others. There is a wisdom in indigence that is lost to many of us. Jesus seems to be living this out. Jesus is working to empower the person of low caste right exactly where they are. 
in order to change their condition. In order to change their position. Jesus is working to empower the person just as they are in order to change their condition and in order to change their position. Jesus presumes the dignity and worth of Bartimaeus and encourages him to express his faith forthrightly. Individual dignity is affirmed while at the same time the need of the crowd and perhaps especially the need of the disciples is also meant. This is also a teaching moment, an occasion to learn something from someone who cannot see. It is a chance for the disciples to witness and even learn from the faith of the blind, a faith that sees and knows and now is emboldened even to move out of the dirt. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks Bartimaeus. My teacher, let me see again. No longer son of David. Jesus is addressed as my teacher. In Aramaic, Rabuni, Rabbi. It is again an immediate and personal response that Jesus gives. That's it. It's all good, Jesus said to him. Go, your faith has made you well. Go, Bartimaeus, go on your way. Go on the way, just don't go away. You may be in filth, Bart, but you are not of filth. Your faith has made you well. Faith trumps filth. So goes the encounter of a holy man and a lowly man. For the holy and the lowly share an intimate distance. I'm convinced that most of our lives are spent seeing far more than we can know. But encountering God's call to mercy and service can heal one of that. The Native American Black Elk once spoke from what he called the center of the world. He was on Harney Peak. And on that peak, Black Elk spoke and said, There I looked over the whole earth and I understood more than I saw. Theologian Wilfred Cantwell Smith distinguishes faith from belief. Belief, Smith says, is given to you by your family, by your geography, and the century in which you live. Faith, however, is given to you by God. And it is an ever-present temptation of which we must be cautious that church can so often become about beliefs, doctrines, official teachings, over and against faithfulness. Church is about doctrines, and they serve important roles. But doctrines are not supposed to be cold, external teachings that we memorize and hold authority with. They are not simply to be handed down through a tradition. 
Cold teachings did not build Christianity. Faithfulness was at the center. A faithfulness, a faithfulness that God responds to. That faithfulness is an understanding that God responds to human need. That God meets human need right where it is. Just as it is. And that human need trumps the law. That blind beggar... Bartimaeus knew more than he saw, for he could not see at all. His loud cry was received and returned in Jesus. Jesus stops himself and calls forth, truly knowing and truly seeing. To really know and to really see means not assuming that you understand. It means asking the least among you, what do you want me to do for you? At the center of the deep dramas that are played out between gravity and grace in human life, between God's way and the human will, there lies an important question. What do you want me to do for you? It is a call to heal, to serve, to teach, and to unite. It is a question meant to build human dignity. But it is also a call out of ignorance. This call lifts a person out from the periphery and places them into the dynamic ways of God. God asks, what do you want me to do for you? And hopes you know what you're asking for. The faith of God thus is placed in you and me. If you answer the call like Bartimaeus, covered in dirt, and uncloaked before the king, then your faith has already been at work, and you will go with God, led by new eyes. Can I get an amen? Amen.